Hello folks, my name is Rick Pearson and this is Prophecy USA, a program specifically designed to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. Have you ever wondered what is the greatest miracle that ever happened in the Bible? According to scripture, there's one coming that will affect every person on planet Earth. Join us today for question and answers as we discuss the mystery Jesus foretold concerning the believers of Philadelphia. Stay tuned. Welcome to Prophecy USA. You know, we're in our Bible study podcast studio where my wife, my wonderful wife Karen and I answer questions, live chat on the internet every Thursday at 7 p.m. EST time. For an hour. For one hour. And we've been talking about the churches, uh, the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Uh, and Karen, in the last several weeks, We've answered questions concerning every church except Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, if you remember, Ephesus was a group of believers that had lost their first love. Sardis was a group of believers who Jesus called that they called them and said, "Your your works are dead. They were dead works." Mm -hmm. Pergamos was involved in sexual immorality outside of holy matrimony. And then, of course, there was Thyatira, uh, where these believers started practicing pagan religions of ancient Babylon, which is what Jezebel taught. Uh, then there was Laodicea, who were rich in substance, but were not being generous towards God in their giving. They didn't prioritize their, their finances. Of course, there's Smyrna, who was the persecuted church, who Jesus said, wait and you will be rewarded with crowns of righteousness. So today, what we're going to look at is the seventh group of believers who had avoided all of the shortcomings of the first six churches. Her name is the Church of Philadelphia. Remember, the Bride of Christ is only part of the body of Christ. Matthew 25 says that only five of ten virgins were ready for the bridegroom's arrival. Now, the five virgins went with the bridegroom, but as soon as they left, the door was shut behind them, and the five other virgins missed their own wedding. So in addressing the seven churches, Jesus was trying to get the bride ready for his arrival. But when it came to Philadelphia, Jesus was very pleased with their works, with their worship, and obviously, they were already counted worthy to escape the things that would soon come to pass. Now, before our Q&A, or question and answers, let's take a look at the remnant of believers that Jesus called the Church of Philadelphia. To the Church of Philadelphia, Jesus says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no man can shut. I know that you have but little strength, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Because you have kept the word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of tribulation that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. It appears that the Philadelphia believers are differentiated from all the other churches previously mentioned. It does appear, however, that these believers will suffer some persecution from the synagogue of Satan. In other words, they have been tested even to the point that Jesus said, I know that you have but little strength. If you stand up for traditional marriage, you are called homophobic. Against Muslim terrorism, you are called Islamophobic. If you stand up for Israel, you are called apartheid racists. 
If you stand up for the life of the unborn, you are accused of having a war on women. If you believe Jesus is the only way to salvation, you are accused of being a narrow-minded bigot. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets before you. God will judge you based on what you know and how you put into practice what you have been taught. The more you know, the greater your accountability to obey his words. Welcome back. Well, Karen, you have a multitude of questions in, uh, concerning the seven churches. I sure do. And, and some, some not concerning the seven churches. Yes, and some strong statements too. Okay. Uh, so let me start out with a question that was sent in by Doreen. Um, actually, not a question. This is a statement. Prophecy USA, you are wrong. America is not in scripture. You are just trying to spread fear so you can make money on your book and on your online scam. Stop it. Wow. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those of you who feel that way, Darlene, uh, we did not write the Bible. We did not write the 53 descriptions of Babylon the Great prophesied over 800 years ago by multiple prophets. We did not create the legal system of the USA founded upon Judeo-Christian principles of Scripture. We did not place the statue of Moses at the highest peak of your Supreme Court building, confirming that mandate. We did not make America meet all 53 descriptions of Babylon. And we did not write history, nor are we attempting to write the future. But we are showing people what the Bible says and allowing everyone who has ears to hear what God's Word says. You and you alone must join the dots. It is God who declares the end from the beginning, and it is God who has spoken it, and it is God who will bring it to pass. It's God in 850 BC who spoke through Amos the prophet and said, Surely the Lord will do nothing except He reveal it unto His servants the prophets. And it's the same God today who promised us that when the Holy Spirit has come, He will guide you into all truth. And He will personally show you things to come. Jesus spoke to the last day believers because He was fulfilling God's mandate, standing in the gap as our high priest, but also as our prophet or our watchman. If thou doest not speak to warn the wicked from his way, and the wicked die, their blood I will require at thine hand. Doreen, we believe God put us on television not because he wants your money. He wants your soul. He wants you to spend eternity with him. But you have to decide to accept that invitation. And Jesus specifically stated to the last day believers let him who has ears hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Unfortunately, two of the 53 descriptions of Babylon the Great, number 15 and 16, infers that the majority of people in Babylon have no clue that they're living in a providential nation that is about to be judged in biblical proportions. There's a remnant of believers in Babylon However, and around the world, they're watching, they're waiting, they are meditating, and they are getting ready for one of the greatest events in Bible prophecy. Something very good is about to happen to those who trust in Jesus Christ. But something very terrible is awaiting for those who don't. And the Church of Philadelphia is waiting for that hour that will change everything. And Daniel warned us, the wicked shall not understand, but the wise shall understand. So we appreciate your comments. Was it Doreen? Yes, it was. We appreciate your comments, Doreen, and your sincere honesty, but you're sincerely wrong in what you think about what we are. 
But thanks for listening, and we appreciate your comments. All comments are welcome. All comments are welcome. And here's another from the opposite side of the spectrum, from okay. Brenda. I watch your program, Rick, and your Thursday night Bible study, and I love the teaching. However, some of it made me fearful until you explained the two types of fear. I'm not afraid anymore. Thanks, Brenda. You know, many people don't know the two types of fear, and according to Scripture, they're both rooted in the spirit world. There's the worldly fear and the godly fear. Second um, Timothy says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of a sound mind. And 1 John 4.18 says, Perfect love casts out worldly fear, because worldly fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Now, Jesus said, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You know, in the, uh, one of our other programs, we mentioned uh, the seven spirits or characteristics of God, how uh, Jesus walked and the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and uh, he had wisdom, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might and knowledge and fear of the Lord. And Jesus delighted himself in the fear of the Lord. So the bottom line is this, love others and fear God. You know, if it was good enough for Jesus, Karen, it's good enough for me. <laughs> and we'll find in the next segment that those of you who are seeing in Scripture what we are seeing, there is a mandate, especially for such a time as this, not to fear man, but fear God, who is about to judge those who refuse to fear, honor, and obey His commandments. In other words, if you have your priorities in the right order, there is a huge reward awaiting the believers of the last days a chosen generation, the Church of Philadelphia. Folks, we'll be right back after this message. The United Nations has a 2030 agenda. The World Economic Forum has a great reset. The COVID-19 pandemic has an accelerated mandate. But as the New World Order plans their world without God, nothing will be accelerated faster than the prophetic word God has spoken to the United States of America. It will be the hour that changes everything. Prophecy USA is proud to present their latest book, The Hour That Changes Everything. Together with our study guide and free app, prepare yourself for one of the greatest events in Bible prophecy. Go to prophecyusa.org or call the number on your screen now to make your donation of $35 or more and receive your copy of the book, The Hour That Changes Everything. We are waiting to hear from you. Call today. Welcome back. We're answering questions today concerning the Church of Philadelphia. Now, this is the only group of believers in the last day that Jesus promised an open door of escape for the hour of trial that shall come upon the whole world. And we just learned that this group has ears to hear Jesus' warning, and through godly fear, not fear of man, they're getting their houses in order for the big event. Karen, do we have a question concerning that open door? There's a question from Tom. He says, I have studied the scriptures, and it says that Christians are found in the tribulation and are martyred, yet, according to scripture, the Church of Philadelphia escapes. Many Bible teachers don't believe there is a pre-tribulation rapture. Why do you lean towards a pre-tribulation rapture? Okay, uh, thank you, Tom. Everybody agrees there is a rapture, uh, which is described in Scripture quite, qu quite clearly with a first resurrection and secondly with those who are alive and caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's in 1, second, second, that's in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. The difference in interpretation regards the timing of the rapture, not the rapture itself. 
uh, and we believe this miracle will happen before the tribulation begins, and, and here's some of the reasons. Number one, why did Jesus warn the churches of the particular sins they were committing in advance of the tribulation? Why would he warn us if we were going to go through it? And number two, as you mentioned, Tom, why else would Jesus commend the church of Philadelphia that he would give them an open door to keep them from that hour of tribulation that is coming upon the whole world? Mm -hmm. Number three, why did Jesus tell the parable about the ten virgins and five were ready and five weren't? The five that were left were still virgins. They were still engaged to be married, but they missed their own marriage. Right. He didn't say they were non-believers. Number four, why did the angel describe the destruction of Babylon in Revelation 18, and then in Revelation 19, 1 through 7, describe rejoicing in heaven after Babylon's destruction, and stating that the marriage of the Lamb has come or begun, and the bride has made herself ready? To be ready was the exact warnings Jesus gave to the ten virgins and six out of the seven churches. You know, Revelation 19 is one of our major time sequences pinpointing and confirming the pre-tribulation interpretation. Babylon, which we obviously believe is the United States of America, must be deposed before the marriage of the Lamb begins. Number five, why does the angel reference Christians six times in the tribulation? Presumably those who miss the rapture? Scripture says that they are tested, martyred, and beheaded on earth while the marriage in heaven is already taking place. Mm -hmm. So they passed, they failed the test before the tribulation. Now they're going to go into the tribulation and God's going to severely test them. Are these the believers that refused Jesus' warnings and did not flee the sins that so easily beset them? Or are they new converts? Some people say they're new converts. We believe they're people also that missed the rapture. These are the scriptures that we stand on to support pre-tribulation rapture. And Tom, I hope this answers your question. I think you've got another one there, Karen. Uh, this is kind of a comment, and it's from Barb. She says, I love your teaching, Rick. After reading your study guide, I'm convinced that America is Babylon the Great. However, it really troubles me whether or not I am worthy to escape the judgment that is coming. I don't think I'm worthy. Well, Barb, if you, uh, if you think you're worthy, there's a pretty good chance you're not. You know, that is why Jesus emphasized to pray mm -hmm. that you are worthy. Mm -hmm. But here is something to consider. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and I will come again and receive you unto myself. When it was time to enter the promised land, only Joshua and Caleb confessed that God was able to defeat the giants. The other ten spies declared and confessed that God was not able uh, to take out the giants. That was after the ten plagues, the Red Sea parting, and the whole Egyptian army being made fish food by the hand of God. There are several verses, Numbers 13, Hebrews 11, 6, that talks about our faith. So when the spirit of fear comes knocking at your door, according to Hebrews 11:6, 6, it says, Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Fear will always come knocking at your heart. But according to Scripture, we're supposed to let faith answer, there's nobody home here. There's no room for fear inside of me. So stay clean before God, Love others, and that is Jesus' requirement for you, Barb. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with some more questions.
2,000 years ago, innocent blood was shed for you. But will America come back? Will she seek God's forgiveness or will she suffer His judgment? Prophecy USA proudly presents a study guide addressing America's spiritual state of the union concerning her past, present, and future role in Bible prophecy. Call right now with your donation of $20 or more to receive your copy, 1-888-306-1759, or go online to prophecyusa.org right now. Welcome back, folks. We're answering questions on the Church of Philadelphia, one of the seven churches that Jesus listed in the book of Revelation. Karen, do we have a, uh, our next question ready to go? We do. It's from Barry. He writes and says, Rick and Karen, I have learned so much from your Bible study podcasts. I watch them every Thursday at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. In your discussion on the Church of Philadelphia, Jesus promised us the open door to escape the tribulation. But then it says, for thou hast little strength. What does that mean, especially for us in North America? Oh, that's a good question, Karen. You know, in Revelation 3.8, that's, uh, that's what Barry's referring to. Yes. And it says, For thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and has not denied my name. Uh, Barry, this verse does not go into detail. But when you compare it to Scripture that describes Babylon, it could mean that persecution of believers in North America could go farther than the name-calling and the phobia bombs that the progressives currently hurl at Christians. You know, the progressive ideology has a phobia attached to anything that opposes them. In fact, uh, Isaiah prophesied, I was angry with my people, I polluted my inheritance, and I gave them into thine hands. We have a lot of name-calling and phobias but we really haven't had any physical persecution. But if that happens, it says, Upon the ancient one hast thou heavily laid thy yoke, O Babylon. In the past, I'd interpreted this verse with the shedding of innocent blood. However, within the future Canadian and USA and United Nations human rights legislation, there's being proposed hate crimes based on speech and the unwillingness to support certain lifestyles. Now, we have children in Canada being taken away from their parents because they want to transgender to another gender. The parents say no, and all the government says is they're coming against the human rights of that child. We also have laws that have come uh, that come against conversion therapy bringing sentences up to a five years prisonment. Those laws are colliding head-on with Judeo-Christian teaching. Will that bring persecution or not? I don't know. Uh, recently, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who was a die-hard partisan. He's really strong in one party. And as a pondering question, I asked him, if someone is wearing a red hat in support of a political party and another person comes out of nowhere and sucker punches that person in the face for no other reason than because they're wearing a red hat, is the person wearing the red hat a fascist or is the person who punched them in the face the fascist just because they believe differently than them? And I could get no answer from my friend. You know, the Bible states that the night before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, Lot tried to warn everyone of the coming judgment. The men of Sodom demanded that Lot hand over the two angelic visitors that visited Lot, and they were staying in his home. And that those Sodomites said, we want to know these men or commit sodomy with them. Now, once Lot refused to participate, in the Sodomites' plans, they physically threatened Lot by saying they would do worse to Lot if he did not hand over his visitors to them. They equated Lot's refusal to participate as Lot judging them. That's found in Genesis 19.9. Now, Isaiah warned 12 nations of coming judgment, 
And the king, who was his grandson, had him sawn asunder. Jeremiah warned Judah of Babylon's coming invasion, and they threw him in a cistern. Both nations fell after they judged the prophets. Now, Scripture says that we're not supposed to judge others. For how you judge others, God will judge you. If secular humanists and the progressive movement start judging Christians and begin persecuting them beyond just verbal insults, it could be the tipping point that provokes God's hand to fulfill the judgment prophesied to come to Babylon the Great. And it's possible that Philadelphia believers who are promised to be delivered through the open door may be tested in this manner to the point that they have little strength left before their rapture. You know, this is not new for secular humanists' mode of operandi. Stalin did it, Hitler did it, North Korea does it, and so does China. Secular humanists, progressives in America, will they do it? Time will tell. Watch for mounting hatred towards Christian values. And I hope it doesn't go that far, but it might. But if and when it happens, keep your eyes on Jesus, because he said, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. And we've been raised up to help you do just that. What's the next question, Karen? The next question comes from Christy from Burlington, Ontario, which is not far from here at all. Christy says, I watch your program and I've learned so much, but how can a person be sure they belong to the Church of Philadelphia and are ready for the rapture? Christy, that's a great question. Uh, the best way is to follow the warning Jesus gave to the seven churches. Number one, you must be born again. Ask Jesus into your heart and just say, Dear Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, and help me to be more like you. Um, make Jesus your first love. Everything that you do, do it as unto the Lord when you treat others. Live a lifestyle free of immorality. Take some of your first fruits and prioritize your finances and help someone less fortunate. Forgive those who persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. Rejoice in being exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And finally, pray that you might be counted worthy. That's what Jesus said to do. And Karen and I are putting all these principles into place because we've read the book and we've studied to show ourselves approved and we are voting pre-trib rapture all the way. And next week, we're gonna take questions on some of those things that are going to come to pass after the rapture takes place. In the meantime, this is Prophecy USA. I'm Rick Pearson, and this is Karen Pearson, my wonderful wife, and we're reminding you that Jesus is alive and he's coming back much sooner than many people think. See you next week on Prophecy USA. Shalom.